citizen. Oh, oh, oh. Out of many we are. We are world citizen. Same vision is for equal rights and justice. For the people, them, what's happening to this beautiful world that we're living in? World citizen, lift up your voices. Welcome to another edition of the People Powered Planet Podcast. Each week we have amazing solutionaries from around the world. While others may focus on the super terrible problems of the world, we focus on what are the solutions and visions for a better future. Today, our special guest is an extraordinary visionary from an extraordinary visionary family, Robin Lloyd. Uh, Robin Lloyd, uh, and she will be telling you about her ancestors, were actually at the very birth of uh, the World Citizen Movement way back in the 30s. Uh, she's, she's been an incredible, uh, uh, she, she, she heads the uh, uh, Green Valley Films, and she produced an extraordinary film uh, about Gary Davis called Passport to Freedom. Uh, we used some clips of it in our movie, The World is My Country. Uh, she also is very active in the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and, and uh, Toward Freedom and many other groups and organizations that are working for a better world. Um, so let me just jump, launch right into it and ask Robin to tell us a little bit more about, uh, about her journey and about her ancestors and what they have to tell us today about how we fix some of the problems of the world. What was it that threw your ancestors into inventing new creative solutions that others weren't thinking of around them? Well, I think it started when I um, went on the peace train to Beijing in 1995 with uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And there we were, we were crossing borders, boundaries and so on. And, having a good time and thinking we were courageous. And then I thought back to my grandmother, Lola Maverick Lloyd, and the boundaries and borders that she crossed uh, prior to World War I to try to stop World War I. And I thought, oh my goodness, she was, she was uh, truly a visionary and I want to get to know her more. Luckily the family uh, our family keeps lots of papers and has archives and so on. So I researched her and uh, and made a little uh, performance piece for her. So I can tell you right now some of the wonderful aspects of her life. She was born Lola Maverick in, in Texas, uh, the granddaughter of Samuel Maverick, whose name Maverick has been given to humanity to mean a uh, independent person it was based on he didn't he didn't brand his cows so that if anyone saw a cow wandering around they would say it's a maverick so um she uh, was able to go to uh, she decided to leave the south and go to smith college and she got her um got her education there and now i'm going to start this little slideshow thing um, and here is, can you see it? Yes. Yes, okay, so there's a picture of um, Lola uh, at, at Smith College. Uh, a few, she graduated in uh, 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 economics, actually. A few years later, she and some friends went down to visit uh, the home of uh, Henry Demarest Lloyd, and uh, here's a picture of him. Oops, no, there he is, okay. Um, and uh, there, there were four girls going down and they were meeting the four sons of Henry's. Um, Henry is a, uh, was a incredible uh, uh, writer and uh, a real visionary and uh, a muckraker, his most famous book is uh, Wealth Against Commonwealth, which I think is, a, is an excellent title for uh, a book that uh, reveals how back then in the 1890s, the corporations were really trying to take over the country and this was an expose of Standard Oil. Hmm. So, wow, he was way ahead of his time. We think of that as a current day problem. But uh, he was at the very root, root, talking about the root of the problem way back then. 
yeah, yeah. And um, so she married his oldest son, William. He had four sons, and Lola married William, and they went to live together in Winnetka, Illinois, near Chicago. And unfortunately, uh, Henry died just a, a year or two after they were married. Uh, Lola and William were married. But I think there was time enough for him, for her to glean <clears throat> the wisdom from him and to meet his many friends like Jane Addams and so on in Chicago. So um, then uh, here's a later picture of uh, Lola. She, uh, she, they had four children and, uh, and she was sort of a, uh, you know, housewife, a well-to-do housewife uh, involved in issues uh, in the community. So but, what, so what launched her on the, onto creating the campaign for world government? Uh, well, this lady, this lady, <laughs> this is um, Rosica Schwimmer. And Rosa Kuchwimmer was a, uh, a Hungarian uh, suffragette who, um, who spoke some six different languages. And at the beginning of World War I, in other words, it was in uh, 1916, 1913 and 14, she was becoming aware of the uh, hostility between the different countries of uh, Central Europe and she came to America and this was in 1915 when the war had already started and she traveled around America and she said this could be a, an incredible catastrophe. Uh, you, you Americans have to tell your president and she actually went and told him too do not get involved in this war, offer mediation. And that was her big, her big thing, and which became Lola's too, because they became very good friends. And uh, together with um, Jane Addams, they went to Washington and helped create the Women's Peace Party. And then, and this is incredible what they were doing because, you know, they didn't have the vote by then, women were, left out of all sorts of power situations in in the culture at that time but they uh they rented a boat in the uh let's see this the spring of uh, 1915 and uh because they had received an invitation from european uh activists to say we really we need you, we need to come together and offer, find some way to stop this war. Hmm. So that was extraordinary. Women taking the lead, uh, women who were early suffragites, uh, taking the lead in trying to stop a war uh, at a time when most people uh, you did not even feel women had a right to be in politics. And here these women had the courage mm -hmm. to buck the system, not only to stand up for feminism, but to stand up for for a peaceful world, uh, courageous, courageous pioneers. Yes, absolutely. And there they were, you know, uh, uh, their, their fathers and their sons might have been on the, uh, you know, the front of the war killing each other, but here the women came together, some from Germany, many from Holland, a few from France, England, and the United States. And, um, out of this came a proposal, mainly from Rosica Schwimmer, that we should, uh, that the group should go to the different heads of state, of course they were all men at that time, and propose, um, ask them to mediate the war. And so they did that. They, again, crossed dangerous boundaries. The war was already going full tilt. And, um, and they met with uh, heads of state and one of them said, um, I think the conversation we've had in this room is the most sensible one I've had since the war began, but he didn't do anything about it. And as we all know, um, uh, Wilson joined, brought the United States into the war in 1917. Well, do you think she had an impact on getting him to... Uh... Uh, to afterwards try to create a League of Nations to try to prevent this kind of thing in the future? 
Yeah, well, that was certainly, um, I think she did, all of them had quite an impact on him. But, um, and then he proposed the League of Nations, but of course the United States didn't join it. Um, it was by one vote that it failed, is that right? Uh -huh. And yeah. and what, what happened then, of course, was the um, uh, Versailles Treaty, uh, which will pretty quickly came in, out uh, against it, seeing that it would have, it would, it, Put, putting harsh reparations on um, Germany would not be um, would would not lead to really a peaceful relationships with those in Europe. And of course, we were right. That was uh, the Versailles Treaty was was in its way a disaster. And um, and it's and it's interesting that even Winston Churchill, one of the key arch architects of the war, uh, says in our film that there never was a war easier to prevent than World War II. And that if we had, if, if we had adopted the League of Nations and if we had not you know, imposed that treaty, but instead uh, brought them into the community of nations, World War II never would have been, never would have been fought. And here is the, the, the key architect of the war saying that. So uh, I think your, 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 your uh, ancestors were ahead of their time. And, um, and, and that was a narrow miss that might have helped humanity in immense ways. But anyway, let me let you continue with uh, with her story. Well, so yeah, what I kind mean, of impact she had on you and the world as this went on? Yeah, well, it, just to continue with the, the rest of her life, the arc of her life, uh, and all of the women in the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom who were so committed to trying to stop World War I. And then when in the 20s and in the 30s, continue that struggle. I mean, you know, there was the kellogg Brion Pact. Do you remember that in 1928? Yes, we, can, we see a scene of that in the movie where, uh, where it actually states that, uh, that, uh, uh, that at that point, it was really believed that that was gonna outlaw war. Mm -hmm. That was, that, that was it, it was a renunciation of war as an instrument of policy and everyone signed it, or at least the United States uh, and and uh, France, I believe Russia signed it, but uh, we that was violated. And armaments were continued to be built up. the The other big issue that Wilf got involved with, and and my grandmother as well, she was active in Wilf very much during all this time. Uh, was the um, were the um, uh, disarmament conferences that were happening, looking into uh, how much money, say, DuPont made in World War I uh, through selling armaments. And it was at that time, DuPont was very involved in torpedoing any disarmament talks. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, but the hearings that they had, uh, did not really have an impact. And Lola could see that possibly the countries were leading towards another war and with the rise mm -hmm. of, of Hitler. And so it was in 1936 that she formed, along with uh, Rosica Schwimmer, the Campaign for World Government. And uh, so now we're seeing this picture of, 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 uh, of Rosa uh, of Schwimmer on the screen. And uh, that quote of hers, now, now you're going to the next picture, that quote of hers was way ahead of its time. So yeah. we'll go ahead, uh, tell us a little bit more about her a moment before you go on to the next slide. Okay. Uh, what was her relation? She was a, a, an inspiration to your family, is that correct? Yeah, she was, um, well, I mean, the, one of the things that happened uh, when they were on the bus to the Hague conference, which was, um, uh, so important to Lola and to Rosica, but Lola's husband came along. And unfortunately, at the end of the uh, boat trip, he took off with another woman, another peace activist, and uh, spent a couple of weeks in um, Sweden. And my mother was, my grandmother was outraged, and but she was very committed to the Hague Conference, and she was 
really sort of Rosica's uh, aide de camp and, and the two of them would spend the nights writing, writing up the documents for the next day. And, uh, and so, you know, I can't forgive my grandfather for doing that. And she didn't forgive him either. And she divorced him when she got home. So um, Lola then was a single mother with four kids. Luckily, she did have money of her own uh, as a maverick. And uh, she created a, um, an office in, in Chicago to that became the center of sort of uh, political activity and peace, peace activities um, until. And does, doesn't President, didn't President Kennedy basically credit uh, Women's Strike for Peace and Women's International League for Peace and Freedom as being the, the ones who helped inspire the nuclear test ban that did finally get passed? Mm. I didn't know that. I think so. Yeah, probably that uh, Women's Strike for Peace was a spinoff from uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, but we were all fighting together there. So just to put an end to it, um, my grandmother died in 1944. So she died in the middle of the war. Her, her daughter, she had three daughters and one son, and her daughter, uh, Jessie, said, uh, that she, that she thought that Lola had died of a broken heart. That all that she cared about was, which was peace and um, ending war, was obviously um, not to, to not to happen. Um, her three, her her four children, including my father, um, were continued in peace activism, and in fact. Uh, Mary and Georgia, especially, were were friends with Gary Davis. Hmm. So let's jump into uh, Gary Davis. You okay. were Gary Davis's girlfriend, um, and that must have been, and that was for like a, a quarter of a, a, a for a quarter of a century, right? And mm -hmm. so, wasn't that uh, with someone who's so dedicated to the cause? Uh, that must have been both a challenging and must have led to some interesting discussions. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your relationship with Gary and mm -hmm. uh, and how that evolved over the years. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting that um, I knew him, I had heard of him in my family even when I was a teenager because uh, my aunts would speak about him. Um, Mary was in charge of the People's Registry at 55 Rue La Cepede in Paris where um, some of the papers were kept and the uh, registrations for what was before World Service Authority, what, was what they had in, in Paris. And uh, she would come back and tell about things. And I'm, I must say the detail that I remember, and this is as a teener, teenager, was about when, uh, when Gary was arrested for stealing lingerie in Paris. Right. Yeah, that was that was kind of an oddity, and, and that, that was a case where Gary felt that he wanted to try to catch these the governments in their own contradiction. So he had been ordered to leave, and then he got he said, "Well, if I can get another order from a court that I'm not allowed to leave, that'll create a contradiction in the system." So he very publicly and obviously stole a piece of lingerie because he he had a very good theatrical sense that this was going to get into the papers. And so now he had one court saying you can't leave and another court saying you have to leave. And he was trying to catch them in that contradiction. Gary wasn't somebody who would, would steal things, but he saw the opportunity for a media opportunity here. And he said, okay, this will be both funny and it will uh, will catch the system in its own contradictions. Uh, so go ahead with your, your story, what happened out of that. Yeah, but he, he realized that he, for one time, he didn't do it quite right. He didn't issue a, uh, uh, a, a press release or something ahead of time. So as it was portrayed in the papers, it was like he's a, you know, salacious old man, and he wasn't that old then, um, doing something perverse. Whereas, as you say, he was doing it for political reasons and he made that clear, clear afterwards. Uh, but that was, uh, that led to um, a sort of one of his most difficult times uh, and what's amazing is even the difficult times as he writes about them were 
learning experiences and um, and the deprivation that he faced and the jails that he faced, uh, it was as if that was, it was just part of life for him. And if he had to stay forever, um, he would, he would do that. What happened was he got, he, he wanted to leave France. So he got a little, um, uh, boat a little um rubber boat and and paddled across to italy and got arrested there and had to spend a couple of months in a refugee camp which was quite uh, quite a difficult experience for him but very enlightening about the refugees there in fact he managed to to get out of the refugee camp and he went back in with papers to give um, passports to the people in the refugee camp. So all of his difficult experiences, he, he, learned, uh, he, he learned how the poor people live, how people without papers live uh, through these experiences of being in jail in the refugee camp. And it was, and that, so that was in, uh, that was in 57 or 58. Then Italy flew him back to the United States and, and the story goes on. He formed. Now, uh, now is that, now when was it in the story that you met him and how did you get together? Yeah. Um, well, he was coming through uh, Burlington in uh, in December of uh, 1990, and he was actually going to visit his daughter. Uh, um, Gary had three children, and his daughter was in uh, Athena was in Montreal, and it happened to be a New Year's Eve, and um, so uh, we went we went out on the town together, and uh, that was the beginning of a beautiful beautiful relationship that had definitely ups and downs. <laughs> After and that, that was that um, he wanted to go to, uh, you know, the, the, the walls were coming down in, uh, in Eastern Europe. The, the Berlin Wall was coming down in the spring of 1990. And he wanted to be there and I was glad to go with him and I was sort of his, his uh, documenting his him and his journey and uh it was as if the world was was following the edicts of gary davis the walls were coming down you know the borders were breaking down and and so to be able to pass through um control places as shown in the film going into germany but was it east germany west germany i mean everything was in flux and so it was a wonderful time to be there and stand on the wall with him and go to uh we went to prague and came back and his the passport was accepted and stamped uh, yeah that people get to see that live actually right in the movie uh you see the wonderful footage you shot of him up close of him going through the passport office uh there they're, they're looking at his passport, bringing in a superior to look at it, and then they stamp it and send him through. Were you, were you sweating when they asked the superior to come in? Were you thinking they might turn you back? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, there's always that, that possibility for Gary, and, and then you get turned back and you try to come another way. I mean, for example, the most out outrageous moment was that we were uh, trying to get uh, visas to go into Russia. And um, he uh, he put his hand in his pocket to bring out his world, world citizen passport, but what he brought out was a Oceanus passport. This was a whole other uh, project of Gary's to create passports for for people on the ocean, for seamen and sailors and so on that have such a hard time and you know for example they've had a horrible time during the during this virus time of going to not being able to go ashore and so on but um so he uh, together with a friend of his created an oceanus a passport and identity and and so there and the one he he had for himself was ambassador 
ambassador from Oceania. So he brought this, he didn't mean to do it. So he was, he caught himself by surprise. Uh, <laughs> and the guy said, oh, Oceanus, what is this? And Gary said, uh, oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an island in, um, in, in down near Malaysia. And, uh, and, and the guy took out a, 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 you know, a list of nations and said, uh, well, I don't see it listed here. And um, he said, well, it's all new. It's just been formed. And so um, he, uh, he prevailed. I was totally amazed because this guy was a, a Dutch, very uh, well-trained, you know, control person. And yet he, he accepted this passport. I mean, Gary had a way of, of uh, sort of charming people. And uh, he looked like a very straight... Uh, uh, middle class, upper middle class, uh, the white elite. So he was able to, he was able to do these things. Wow. Well, what were some other extraordinary uh, opportunities you had with Gary, where he did uh, did things like that, where they were kind of mind boggling and and uh, you know, I, I broke the mold. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, we uh, we went to uh, Haiti and. Uh, I know I've I got I just to show you I have passports from uh, this is the earliest one ninety five um, and then uh, two thousand and three two thousand and seven. Let finally, us see those up close a little more. Hold, hold yeah. those up a little closer to the screen. Well, so they, can... here's the uh, most modern one oh eight. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's the one with the machine readable code at the bottom. And, and now yeah. I think uh, David's on the call. They're moving even to biometric ones. Yes. But uh, the first one that I have, which is um, 95, is, uh, yeah, is, is handwritten. And uh, yeah, just as a, uh, there I am. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So what were some of your experiences crossing borders with Gary with his, his passport? Well, uh, I remember once we, um, we actually went to Canada and back with a group of people in a car and so on. And uh, coming back in, they gave us, gave us a, a problem. And we, what we had to do is we had to go to another entry point and try to get in there and Sometimes he would use a different name, like um, S. Gareth Davis. So they would look him up, and uh, and that was his legal name, right? Yeah, Rather than Gary Davis. Yes. So he would he would have a passport that said S. Gareth Davis, but then they were looking up Gary Davis. Anyway, by the confusion with the two names, I helped him get through a couple of borders well we have we, there's one wonderful video of him going through a border and and they they kind of remember him oh yes mr davis <laughs> and they chat and they send him on through uh he's uh he, he became well pretty well known at some of those borders and uh it seemed like they were were willing to kind of uh they didn't know what else to do with him weren't there many experiences where where nations you know wanted to try to enforce some rules but you just couldn't enforce them on gary <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it seems so. I mean, the thing is, he had a very, um, he, well, he was an actor, and he was an, he was an actor all his life, and, and playful, too. So, although some of my friends said, how can you, how can you hang out with that guy? Uh, <laughs> he did have a, a sweet and playful side that uh, made it, made it okay at times, but at other times, he would say, you are a socialist, and I say you are a capitalist, which he was, as a matter of fact. And um, so we had a number of uh, uh, arguments, <laughs> and he would well, move out, and then he would, then he uh, ultimately bought a house. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, uh, some of your disagreements, and then how they might have emerged into his 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 idea of a whole new way of looking at what government means. Well, you know, he didn't really support uh, other groups. He, uh, you had this form of relationship with, 
you had to become personally a world uh, a world citizen and uh so he would have problems with me and and my commitment to women's international league for peace and freedom um he couldn't always go along with that and um you know he maintained a, a a small airplane and he got in trouble going to canada and bringing someone back from canada uh, they took his airplane and uh, put big chains around it. We took pictures of the airplane with chains. And uh, so, yeah, there were lots of, um, uh, uh, like I say, lots of ups and downs. In relationship to someone like him, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the ups and downs. Uh, how, what about his just total dedication to the cause? Uh, did that, uh, that must have been both inspiring that he was so dedicated, but also, uh, I, I know even in my own life, it can sometimes be challenging to, uh, to my wife that, uh, you know, I have such a single focus. Uh, was that a challenge to you? Well, yeah, I mean, he would, he would come to, to meetings, uh, you know, big meetings, small meetings or whatever, and, um, and sit through them. And then at the end, he would raise his hand and, in some way or other connect whatever the subject was whether whether he could or not make the connection he would make a speech about world government and uh this went over well for a while but i think some people in the community started to groan when he would get up to speak because they'd heard him before and mm -hmm. um, i think he had a that was a problem for him that he felt he wasn't recognized in his own uh, community. Well, I know uh, when we filmed him, and you helped us do that extraordinary filming with him in Burlington with the wonderful uh, diverse, diversity uh, kids and diversity rocks. And uh, I, I think that uh, uh, in the film, I think he began to capture uh, the, the, the incredible story that he had that I think people weren't aware of when he was just, here's Gary, you know, pushing yeah. world citizenship and his passport. And I think that might have uh, helped shake some people's thinking up. Uh, so I'm so glad that we were able to capture that. And yeah. I wanted to say that you were an extraordinary person in making it possible to make the film in so many ways. Uh, we're so glad you're an executive producer because uh, without that wonderful footage you shot and, and without you helping get that set up, that wonderful uh, uh, stage performance with Gary and other things, uh, the movie wouldn't have been possible. Uh, so no, I just want to express my great gratitude to you. Sure, and I, I think um, the one hour film that is going to be on PBS is really quite uh, excellent. And you, you carry the line with Gary telling the story at the age of 91. I mean, that's so incredible. And um, yeah, it all happened on the stage here in Burlington. And um, Ben Cohen was there and other people were there. And uh, Gary did a wonderful job. That was sort of his swan, swan song, and you, you captured him. And I know that he got to see the rough cut even before we discovered there was such incredible historic footage that we edited it in with it. But he got to see the early rough cuts of the movie, and I felt there was a terrific transformation over him. It was almost like an easing of that, of that almost fury that the world wasn't listening to him, and now finally his story would get told. And I think did you, did you think that, did it seem to you that that gave him a great sense of peace as he got toward the end? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you wanted to own his life uh, legally, and uh, you offered to do that, and he, uh, I think he was grateful for that, and what what has been done is, is wonderful. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Now well, we I was so pleased that, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was back in uh, 2000 that I acquired all the all the video and movie rights to his life story. And I'm so pleased that uh, we were able to see that through and that it is now being shown on public broadcasting stations across the country. And of course, now you can go to uh, theworldismycountry.com and click on the little public broadcasting link there and see all the stations where it's playing, including Burlington uh, and other cities, 65 cities across the country and more coming every day and find out how to get it in your area. And you can also click on there and see uh, some of the uh, ways you can get involved in the next steps, or GoFundMe and other things. So just go ahead and uh, uh, check out that site. Well, meanwhile, you have a special friend who uh, 
uh, is on the podcast today, who also experienced uh, uh, having a, part, uh, a husband in her case who was, uh, uh, was extraordinarily dedicated to his cause. Uh, do you want to uh, briefly introduce her? I'd like you to meet Ellen Thomas, and uh, I work with Ellen Thomas, it seems like every day, in Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. We're co-chairs with a third person who I believe is on the call, uh, Cheryl Spencer, um, as uh, co-chairs of Disarm. And um, Ellen has an incredible life story herself and her uh, her involvement with the man who became her husband and uh, created a, uh, a presence in front of the White House for, in his case, 25 years, day and night. So Ellen, tell us the story. Wonderful, thank you. I apologize that my video isn't on. It, it died a couple of days ago, so we'll, you just have to look at my mug there but uh, until you get to see the photo of Thomas. William Thomas, originally born Hallenbeck, um, was an amazing man. And I, my life was pretty ordinary up until the time I, I met him. I, I went to Washington, D.C. in 1983 to uh, try to do something about nuclear weapons. I'd been living in Minnesota, and I decided there was uh, women against military madness had caught my eye, and the nuclear freeze movement had caught my eye, and I decided that this was the most important thing in the world to be working on, and Minnesota probably wasn't the place to do it. So my daughter and I moved to D.C., and I got a job with the National Wildlife Federation and uh, started writing about homeless people. Um, and I was walking through Lafayette Park, north of the White House, one night, and um, I saw two huge signs. One of them was a mushroom cloud that said, Revelation, this need not be your end. And the other was an invitation to President Reagan to come out with the homeless. And I stopped and talked to a little woman who was lying on the sidewalk in the cold March night uh, with nothing to protect her but a ski suit and a wig. And asked her, she said she'd been there for three years. And I asked her if she did it alone. And she said, no, she had a friend. He was a philosopher. His name was Thomas. And so I came back the next day to meet him. And uh, three. Weeks later, I had quit my job and given everything I owned to my 18-year-old daughter and joined the vigil. And three weeks after that, he and I were married in Lafayette Park. Thomas's story was fascinating. He had um, he had had a, a spiritual experience in Los Angeles when he was on a sales trip um, of that made him want, think that he needed to test the, the um, theory in the Bible that you can live without money and uh, that if you're doing what you're supposed to, everything will be taken care of. And he decided to go on a walk across North Africa from Casablanca to Cairo with no money in his pocket. And he had a grand adventure, which uh, he wrote about in his book that I put the link to, Life, Liberty, and the Hot Pursuit. While he was in prison, um, and he was in prison because he had thrown his passport into a lake in uh, England um, after deciding that the nation states were good for nothing except oppression and war, and he had decided to become a world citizen. So, so this led him to a uh, vigil for... 25 years, day and night? And yeah, actually, he was there for uh, from 1981 until he died in 2009. Wow. And um, he was he was there most of the time. During There were other people who helped, of course. There's no way that he could have done it day and night for without taking breaks. And uh, um, the, the, the President Reagan, well, actually, Nancy Reagan wasn't very fond of the vigil. And uh, and the uh, Park Service kept writing new regulations to um, make uh, the vigil illegal. 
and we just kept coming back and towing the line uh, as, as close as we could. We spent three months in prison in 1988 charged with camping. We weren't camping, we were maintaining a vigil. We didn't cook, we didn't, you know, uh, they said we were storing property, but it was literature and, and information mostly and a roll of plastic to protect us from the weather. Um, and Thomas was brilliant. He wasn't formally trained, but he had an amazing mind. And it was a very um, unusual perspective. He, he, he was very logical and he was always questioning and he was Socratic in his methods. He would ask questions of people and, and, and get them to challenge themselves, actually. He would stay up all night talking to people. If you go to the website prop1.org um, and go to the bottom, if you're interested in the vigil, there are links there to videos. Oracles of Pennsylvania Avenue tells the, tells the story and I put the, uh, some of the, his writings into the chat. Manifesto of Independence was what he issued the day that he started his vigil. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's interesting yeah. how one life touches another and one person's story inspires another and the ripples go on and on. Well, now let me turn it back to Melanie to take uh, questions. Hello, hello, yes. Um, oh, Ellen, that was such a fascinating story and amazing what one person can do. And thank you so much for sharing that. And then of course, Robin, mwah, so great to see you. So wonderful, you know, it's been years, but I just, ugh, you're just such an inspiring person. And thank you so much for this fascinating back look into Lola and Gary and, and your experience and your life. And it's just, you know, it's been fantastic. So thank you for all this. Um, we want to, of course, get David Gallup, who is actually at the World Service Authority right now as we speak. So David, if you could come on and give us your comments, uh, we would love it. Hi, Robin. Uh, so great to be here with you today and hear uh, about your uh, family's history of peace activism. I wanted to say uh, thank you so much for the love and support that you gave to Gary for almost, you know, more than 20 years of his life uh, in Burlington uh, and beyond. And thank you for all the support that you've given to his organization, World Service Authority, and even to me personally. You're an inspiration to me. You're an inspiration to, to the whole world. So thank you for that. I do want to share one photograph, which is my favorite, one of my favorite photographs of you and Gary. So if I can share here, uh, I don't, can everybody see that? <laughs> so Robin, I just have a quick question. Can you, I, I mean, I know what this means, but, but where, when was this, or do you remember what this was, you know, what event this was? Well, that's in front of uh, Burlington City Hall, and um, I'm not sure what occasion uh, brought that about. That That's wonderful. I haven't seen that for a while, <laughs> but it's perfect. That's perfect for Gary and me. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, we are on a day-to-day -day basis, so are you as a peace activist with the Peace and Justice Center in Burlington and, and with WILF, trying to make a world, uh, as Gary would say, that is based upon law, not on anarchy, because peace, as Gary would say, peace is not the absence of war, but the presence of law. And this photograph with you and Gary together, it just, it just warms my heart. So once again, I just want to say thank you. And, and I'll keep, keep that to my, all my comments. Thank you. Thank you, David. Great picture. Great picture. <laughs> and now, of course, we want to see what Barbara has to say. Barbara Mueller. And she is the, with Rotary E-Club of World Peace. So Barbara, yes. Thank you. you. Thank, thank you for taking us through this walk in history. Honest to God, I just could not get enough of you or Ellen, the two of you need to be on the center stage and we need to carry this tradition on. But in the meantime, I have a question. Do you have a book, Ellen? And then one, do you have a book, Robin? I'm working on one, but I'm so busy with Women's International League for That's Peace and Freedom, problem. it's hard. <laughs> oh, I know, God bless you. And then why, and then I'm, this is aimed at um, Robin. Robin, why was Gary shy from being as famous as he could have been. What was it in his DNA that said, I don't want this fame, I want to do the work? Well, he had, um, 
you, you know, he had no ambitions to uh, acquire anything, although he came from a family that was well-to-do and who um, uh, he, he sort of enjoyed flirting with wealth but he didn't need it at all. And, um, and so he had a kind of independence about him that um, people could realize that they couldn't use him in any way. He was his own self. And uh, uh, why he didn't get more fame, I don't know, because he certainly tried to, uh, get up close with famous people. When we were in Eastern Europe, we, I forget how it happened that, that we were right there with uh, Jac Jac Jacob, Jacob Havel, Havel. The, at that point, he had suddenly become uh, president of Czechoslovakia, the dissident uh, writer. And he was, uh, and Gary had a passport for him. He was prepared with the photo of Havel in the, in the passport and gave it to him. And Havel said, you know, at the moment, because of all the crazy things here in Eastern Europe, this is the only passport I have. So he was very gurgle. I mean, so Gary made lots of contacts and I think he is, he is well known. How many of these, these buttons exist around the world uh, that, uh, David probably knows how many thousands of them that you've printed up and that he was very diligent in handing out. Of course, that doesn't go that far, but at least it spreads the name of the organization. Thank so you. I, Thank you. That's yeah. yeah, so G Gary, uh, yes, his determination and never stopping, continue, continue. And, and of course, uh, my, my thoughts are that, you know, he didn't care if he didn't want to be like a celebrity. He wanted the message to be the celebrity. He wanted things to change. He was so dedicated to, to getting, to stopping war and making, you know, making the world safe for all of us that um, he, he couldn't, he, he couldn't think of anything else. So, you know, he could a little bit, but mostly he had that, he wanted that to happen for all of us. And as far as um, becoming famous, yeah, I think it probably, his dream would be to everyone to know about this message. That would be, that would, to me, that's what I, my, what that I got from him. You know, get this message across that we can't yeah. have world peace. We need to be all world citizens. And I do believe in that rule of law. And I think that's what Gary wanted. He wanted us all to be individuals, not necessarily ruled by kings or presidents or territories. Yeah, exactly. But who's going to enforce the rule of law? That, um, that that's where the problem lies, that that doesn't exist yet with um, the United Nations or the League of Nations that there's not an enforcement uh, element. And, uh, and that's why he would uh, occasionally walk around with his policeman's uh, uniform and carry a, carry a badge uh, indicating, you know, World Peace Force, I think it was called. The World Guard, the World Guard. World Guard, yes. okay, yeah. Yes, to enforce it. And then of course, Arthur, Arthur always says how it's, we, we would enforce it as, we could enforce it as individuals. Yeah, but you need world law. And um, yeah, so you, let's uh, go to our next question. We have Sky. Sky, if you could ask your question and unmute yourself, please. I am so grateful that I have come onto this podcast today. And so incredibly grateful to have heard what I've heard this morning. So thank you, Arthur, for inviting me. And um, I, I, I guess my question is around this, this comment that the, the statement that, uh, or quote, that you um, showed on the screen today was, I have no sense of nationalism, only a cosmic consciousness of belonging to a human family. And I absolutely love that. And, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering, because I, I feel that. I was born in Zimbabwe, and I've lived in many countries around the world that, as, as I was saying uh, to Arthur a, a few months back, that I've actually called myself a citizen of the world for, for about three years now, not knowing about this idea that I could apply for a world passport, which I'm now so excited about and going to do. 
but people would say to me, you know, do you miss Africa? And oh, I have such a people, if they lived in Africa, I have such a need for Africa to go. And I think, what's wrong with me? I don't really have this nationalism for, Af for, for Africa or for any country that I've lived in. Perhaps New Zealand might be the, the closest one where I felt really something. But I have no sense of nationalism, this cosmic consciousness of belonging to a human family. And I wonder if, do you think it, that it has that message has been forgotten until perhaps now such a time as this again because with COVID-19 um, and everybody's feeling isolated again and separated I, I feel there's such a need right now for people to feel like they that they belong to something bigger and something greater in the world mm -hmm. and um, I, I guess that's that's kind of my question is it, did it did it disappear in order for it to rise again now with something new and something fresh um, or has it just always been there and I've just been the one sleeping well <laughs> let me just jump in and it's partly to answer Barbara's question too I mean the the world the phrase world citizen or global citizen is out there everywhere and people are internalizing it and claiming it and holding big uh, music festivals on in Central Park for a global citizen. Um, and so, I mean, that, that is definitely in the air, in the, in the aura of, uh, of our lives now. And uh, whether, how that can be um, implemented or um, taken to another level, as Gary would say, there are so many, I, I mean, okay, just briefly, one of the ideas I had was that the, uh, there's a big empty hall at the United Nations. It was the trusteeship council. Uh, that should become the world, the headquarters of the world parliament. We have the general assembly, but the general assembly is just, it's like the, the Senate. It's made up of representatives from each nation. The, um, this um, trusteeship council would be the parliament and people would be elected. And I, for a while I was planning to, I was trying to figure out the global uh, population and therefore the population of the United States, we would probably, and the hall fits 600 people. So maybe the United States would only have 10 or so given the population, whatever, but anyway, I charted out how much of the United States I would represent, and then I would go on a campaign as member for world parliament. Uh, that didn't get too far. I tried to get a few other people to do it with me, but, but you know, the idea of having a, a representative government at the highest level would be, is what is needed. It's needed at the United Nations. My husband wrote the plan for world government, and I am so excited that we have a possibility of room at the UN. I have been dreaming about taking this into the 21st century here. We're going to do it, girl. Robin, we are not going to fool around. We're going to take this history, and we are motivated to change the world, and we can do it. If we got all the women on this planet together, we would have such a majority, and we all have a heart. And we have to think with our hearts now. Yeah. Because if we don't, our dreams are going to hold on to nationalism, territory-wise, passports, and all the things that don't work. Right. And, the, and Gary's goal was to not have passports, basically. You know, we need to have like a, a Europe. Where the you freedom. Just freely, freedom. Yeah, it's your right. It's your human right. Right. Um, very good. Uh, so, oh, this is great. Great discussion. Woo -hoo -hoo. Um, so, Alan, Alan had a question. Did you want to ask it, Alan, or do you want me to read it? How is Wolf pursuing uh, United Nations reform and sense of world governmental institutions? And I, a few years ago, it was out there, and then you said you didn't get too much response. And so I say, are you persisting? And then Barbara Mueller there said, definitely persisting forward. This is the time to do it and win. Mm -hmm. So what, what's the plan? Yeah, well, um, at two, in the year 2000, there were many different plans for, uh, for reforming the United Nations. And uh, Wilf was very involved in that. Um, unfortunately, uh, in the idea of having a, a women's, uh, another, a fifth world conference on women, that has not 
moved forward. Uh, as you know, the, the fourth world conference was in 95 and usually it's either t uh, 10 or 20 years later. And so we're more than 20 years past 95 and there's not been a fifth world conference. And there's just a feeling that the governments um, around the world are, have gotten more conservative than they were in 95. 95 created the Beijing Platform for Action, which is a brilliant statement and it needs to be looked at and, uh, and followed now. Some of it has. We have the UN uh, uh, 1325, uh, which was passed in 2000, uh, and Hillary Clinton had a, had a hand in that. And that says women have to be at the peace table. So in Afghanistan now, okay, we're taking the troops out, but are we going? Are the women going to be at the at the peace table there in Afghanistan? That is really essential. Uh, so uh, you know, Wilf is working on it, and international Wilf uh, you is definitely working and working against the arms trade, especially. But reviving the United Nations is a very sticky one. Does anyone else have? ideas for that? <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not sure if Ellen has an idea for that, but uh, Ellen had a, uh, wanted to say something. So Ellen, if you can go right ahead. Thank you. I, no, I don't have an idea for that, but I just wanted to say one thing that I didn't get a chance to say earlier, and it's in the uh, chat, is the link to Proposition 1 campaign, which is a campaign that Women's International League for Peace and Freedom US has, has a, um, embraced for over a decade now and it's uh it, it's been we brought a voter initiative in dc which led to a bill introduced every session since 1994 to abolish nuclear weapons and use the money con to um convert the war machine to clean energy and other human needs. And um, please check it out and help with it. Gary Davis, by the way, was a friend of Thomas's. I, I didn't get a chance to say that either. And uh, Gary um, issued us uh, world passports and we he invited us to come up to the World Service authority office to make photocopies for us to be able to hand out literature at the signs. And he was a good friend. Thank you. That was great. So, uh, Robin, did you have something you wanted to say or? Mm, no. Okay, great. Well, I know that, uh, my goodness, it's just flown by and thank you so much for all your great questions, great discussion. And uh, Robin, Robin's question for anyone there is still up for grabs. So thank you all, wonderful. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for joining us and everyone here. Um, now we're back to Arthur. Yes, and before I start, I just want noticed in the chat from Alfred Schmitter, who uh, talks about uh, developing a planetoid and Earth Council, Universal Council, along with many with the languages. Anyway, he talks about, read about more at the uh, Keshi Foundation. So do copy that from the chat. I will definitely follow up on that and want to talk to Alfred more later about that uh, after this meeting. Uh, there are also an extraordinary number of people working on uh, working with David on developing a digital ID component to the passport. You talked about uh, you know how to in the future move beyond passports. We do need to know people are really people that it's not just some bot or fake thing and uh, David's working on kind of into the forefront with people who are developing an alternative. Uh, and just one other quick comment on the discussion, uh, the confusion about Gary, what happened is Gary, yes, Gary wanted his story known by everybody. He wanted the message known by everybody. What he didn't want and what he turned down was personal power. He didn't want them to say, oh, you're our leader. You, you tell us how to govern. He said, hey, human beings are very inventive. I want to inspire people to invent their own new systems to be the, the, the you know, the, uh, you know, the Thomas Jeffersons and Hamiltons of creating a whole new way that we govern our world. And he also talked about moving beyond the UN and representative democracy. You saw in the movie that, you know, even uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said, you know, the UN is not set up to be a governing structure. He said, why are we banging our heads against the wall trying to reform this old system? We the people just have to take what it says right in that declaration and the constitutions of every, every country and in the uh, reflecting what's said in the Declaration of Independence, we the people have the right to institute new government. 
So uh, yes, it's an incredible time with Global Citizens Fest and so on. And I would invite you to take a look at an article that just came out today on BeliefNet. And in it, I kind of lay out a little bit of how of Gary's vision that we developed working together really on how we move beyond the, 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 uh, the, the old broken systems that have not worked and create something completely new and empowering for the people of the planet. So I want to once again thank everybody for being part of this exciting adventure. Uh, Alfred, if you would email me back afterwards, I'd love to hear more about the uh, Earth Council. And we also, of course, had other extraordinary speakers like Glenn Martin talking about the Earth Constitution and many people evolving ideas for how together we can all build the people-powered planet. So send your friends, just tell them they can go to peoplepoweredplanet.com. That takes them to this club. Make sure people sign up. So make sure you sign up there so you'll get notices of other meetings and also come to theworldismycountry.com. Uh, that's where you'll find links to all of this. And now back to Robin for some closing remarks. Yeah, my closing remarks, I, I forgot to mention uh, my aunt, my aunt Georgia, who uh, was born in 1913 and died in 1999. Uh, she was um, close friends with uh, Edith Winner, who worked with Rosica Schwimmer. So uh, Georgia and Edith created this book, Searchlight on Peace Plans, during the Second World War. They just squirreled away and, and did this research. It's quite incredible. Uh, the uh, the background and the numbers of, of people and famous people and unknown people who have created plans for peace and uh, so take a look at it. I mean this this has lots of nuggets of wisdom in it if you're able to find it. It's not of course maybe easy to find online but but give it a try. Well thank you and that's it for this episode. Join us next week for another episode of the People Powered Planet Podcast. World citizen, lift up your voices. Oh, you know we got something to say. All we need is the same directions, heading in one way. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel and like this video.